When you want to lift something heavy, it helps to have what's known as a mechanical advantage, which means I don't have to lift the entire weight I'm actually trying to move. And in practice, what that means is that I exert a smaller force over a longer distance, and I do the same work as exerting a bigger force over a shorter distance. One familiar way that we do that is with a contraption known as a block and tackle. So if you were in Physics 8 last year, then you might have seen me use this contraption. It basically has one rope here, whereas the rope loops around four times here. You can see that what's attached to the ceiling is basically, well, it's a classic block and tackle. You can look up block and tackle in the Wikipedia. And here's the bottom part. It's basically like a couple of pulleys with ropes looped around multiple times. If I want to move this end of the hook that has four ropes attached to it, if I want to move that one meter, I have to move this single end of the rope four meters. I've marked out, here's one meter, two meters. So there's one, two, three, Four. Okay, pretty good. So this hook went from here up to here, which is a one meter travel for the hook. And to achieve that, I pulled this single rope four meters. And what that means is if we attached some weight here to this hook, I would not have to lift that entire weight. I would only have to lift one quarter of that weight. And if that's a mass M and it goes up some change in height H, I'm doing some work MGH. And I do that same total amount of work, but with a smaller force because I'm exerting one quarter of the force, but I'm traveling over four times the distance. And you say, how would you use that? So one way I would use this mechanical advantage is we've got this pretty large box here and there's just no way I can lift this thing. However, if I hook up this four to one block and tackle, then instead of say 50 kilograms, I only have to lift about 12, 13 kilograms which seems doable, right? So instead of 116 pounds, that's like 29 pounds. So let's see if I can do that. Gee, it's still not exactly easy. This is definitely much more difficult than I remember. Okay, well you see it went up in the air a little bit. Wow, it's gotta be, it's gotta be like 600 pounds because like 150 pounds yeah. won't offset it. You wanna try one into this? Sure. Oh, look at that. There we go. All right, we mechanical advantage. That's right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we should try to weigh it. I think it's gonna go off scale. All right. Like, can you still see the dial? Oh yeah, it like rotated all the way around. It's probably like 400 pounds. So this thing turns out to be 218 kilograms. We found a scale big enough to weigh it. So that's about 500 pounds. So it's no wonder I couldn't lift even a quarter of it. So I put my whole 150 pound weight on the other end and uh, with some effort I got it to budge. While we're here, I guess the idea is I go up a little bit so I think it's not exactly four to one, but it's close. So I only have to pull a quarter of my weight to lift myself up. These gloves are kind of slippery. It's actually probably safer without the gloves. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here is 25 kilograms. A little over 50 pounds. 55 pounds, I guess. Uh, so I can lift that, but it takes some effort. If I connect Mr. Block and Tackle, but to get one meter off the ground, I'll go one, two, three, four meters. Good. Five, six, seven, eight meters. I pull the rope down four meters. The big weight goes up only one meter. I pull the rope down eight meters. The big weight goes up only two meters. That's a four to one mechanical advantage. So instead of having to lift 25 kilograms, effectively, I'm lifting six and a quarter kilograms. Or basically, instead of lifting about 50 pounds, I'm lifting like about 12 and a half pounds. Okay, that's a four to one mechanical advantage. And you can find a block and tackle that'll get you like an eight to one mechanical advantage maybe. But what if you want like a thousand to one mechanical advantage? And I'll tell you why this is relevant. My dad and I once lifted up part of my house to replace a failing beam. So then we really had to lift up an enormous amount of weight. And you say, how would you do that? How in the world are you going to get a mechanical advantage that's like something like a thousand? Well, you can actually make something ginormous lift up much more easily with the help of a fluid. It's actually a lot easier to use a confined fluid. You can see I'm exerting just the tiniest bit of force on the end of this handle. It has to pick up about half the weight, if you remember torque from last year, because I've got it supported on one side and I'm lifting it on the other side. But still, you can see, even lifting half of this weight is 
extremely easy using the confined fluid. Okay, so you saw with the mechanical advantage of four that I was able to lift up this 25 kilogram block without too much effort. But if you want a much bigger mechanical advantage, notice that if I crank this thing, there's from about 30 centimeters to about five centimeters, about, okay, I'm gonna go down about 25 centimeters. And meanwhile, this thing seems to go up only a few millimeters. We'll start at about 20 centimeters. I'll go 10 times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's about 250 centimeters. Actually, I'll go another 10, that'll be 500 centimeters. How about that? So then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I went about 500 centimeters downward because it only moves the fluid when it's downward. And meanwhile, this thing went up. Oh, okay, we started at 20 centimeters and now we're at about 28 and a half centimeters. So that's like a mechanical advantage of about 60. So we just saw that with the small, this thing is rated for two tons. It's a two ton hydraulic bottle jack. And I just estimated a 60 to one roughly mechanical advantage because I moved this thing 500 centimeters and this went up about eight and a half centimeters. So that's roughly 60 to one. We can compare the two ton bottle jack to the six ton bottle jack. And I think what's happening on the, uh, on the input side is the same in both cases, but on the output side, in one case, you have about a two centimeter diameter circle, cylinder. In the other case, we have about a three centimeter diameter circle. So that's about a factor of one and a half in diameter, which is a little more than a factor of two. What's that? A factor of two and a quarter in cross section. And I might not have measured perfectly. <laughs> if we crank, each of them, if we crank each of them, let's say 20 times. Here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. One, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. This one moved by, well, we'll measure the, just the, the exposed metallic colored part. Yeah, a little over eight centimeters. And this is 3.4 centimeters. Eight divided by 3.4. How about that, 2.35? That seems consistent. This one moved up by about 2.35 times as much as this one went up. And that kind of made sense because we measured the diameter of this circle and it was about two centimeters and the diameter of this circle was about three centimeters. So we said, okay, one and a half squared is the ratio of the areas, which is about two and a quarter. And then we said, okay, the ratio of the distances of travel should be about the reciprocal of that. So this is uh, about a factor of 2.35. So you're pushing, each time you crank this up and down, you're moving, displacing a fixed volume of fluid, and that fluid is coming out the other end and it's pushing this cylinder up. And you can see the cross-sectional area of this cylinder times the change in height has to be equal to the volume of fluid that you displace. And this is a larger cross-sectional area, so it's going to take a smaller vertical displacement for the same volume of fluid. This is a smaller cross-sectional area, so it's gonna take a larger vertical motion to displace that same volume of fluid. Okay, we're gonna talk about an interesting problem in many of your physics books. Uh, the problem states that there's a person in a small lake in a canoe and he's got a, a very large boulder in the canoe. And so the canoe is floating. So he decides he's going to throw the boulder over the edge of the canoe. So he does this. The question is, what happens to the level of the water in the lake? There are three possibilities. This is kind of semi-qualitative. We're not going to ask for numbers. But clearly one option would be that nothing happens to the level of the water in the lake and it just remains as it was. But it's also possible that the water level rises and it's possible that it goes down. And so the first thing to do is for you to think a little bit about this and write down your choice. Now, don't just say in your head because then you can kind of hedge your bets. Put it on paper so you got to live with it. So what do you think happens if we throw the boulder out of the canoe and we're keeping track of the lake? Now, many of you are going to say nothing because you've seen such things happen and nothing happens. And the problem, of course, is the lake is huge. The boat and whatever's in the boat, and maybe it's another person who jumps out, are pretty small. Well, we're lucky today. We're lucky that we have a really small lake. Look at this. This is as, as small a lake as you can get and a really big canoe. The canoe is almost as big as the lake. And if you notice when the canoe goes in the water, okay, and have you thought about what floating is? Floating needs buoyancy. And what is buoyancy? Buoyancy is the effect that the water doesn't want to get out of the way of an object that's placed in the container. And so if I am going to push this boat down, the only way for it to go down is for the water to get out of the way. And the only place for the water to get out of the way is to go up the sides. And for you fans of potential energy, what's happening here is we are giving the water potential energy. We're also lucky in that we've got a boulder. Our boulder is a five kilogram mass that just fits into our boat. And so now we're going to put this and let's keep track of this whole operation. So we've got masking tape. So unlike your lake, 
And maybe you could do this with a lake by taking a stick and marking the sand at the shore. So this is pretty much the level of the water. And so we're going to take our boat and put it in our lake. Here's our boat floating in the water and look at that water level. It really changed. So let's mark it. So what just happened here? Well, the canoe and stone pushed water down and the water went up. Now why didn't it push any more down? Well it turns out it had to lose a certain amount of energy to get down here. That's all the energy it's got. If you think about it, once this thing gets underwater, obviously it doesn't have to move any more water, but it only had enough energy to move this much water. And so we've now got an equilibrium. The lost energy in the height of this equals the gained energy here. If it turns out that the water energy is less than our device here, the displacement of the water, then it floats. And of course the energy is is uh, potential energy is MGH, but the G is the same for everybody. And so it turns out that we are going to displace an amount of water equal to the weight of the object. And if it turns out that the object takes up more room than the water that matches its weight, it's going to float. Because now this guy goes in, it pushes that much water out of the way. Here is the weight of the object. The object still has some volume. Let's emphasize the point briefly by getting back to a very light canoe. So we take our boulder out and now we notice that the water level is awfully close because this is just made out of plastic and it has almost no weight and so water is pretty dense stuff and so it only takes that much water to match its weight and it's just hunky-dory so now we're going to take five kilograms of cast iron put it back in here and that means we got to push five kilograms of water out of the way which we've just done and that's as far as we're going to go so now we've kind of given away a lot we'll even give you the opportunity to change your answer before we do it so we're going to take the boulder out throw it into the lake and take a look at the water level. Okay, our lake is so small that we're going to have to get the canoe out of the way in order to throw the boulder in. In it goes. In goes the canoe. Woo! So notice it's very much lower than it was. The canoe is still floating. But of course, the only displacement we have now, we are displacing water equal to the size of our cast iron. The cast iron is really dense, as mm, eight times as dense as the water. And so it takes up very little space. What we have done with the boat is essentially given it more volume. And so now we've got that same mass, that same amount of gravity, but now in order for it to move through the water, it's got to push a lot more water out of its way. And so we're getting volume from the container and we're getting mass or weight from the boulder. And so think about what went on here because this is at the core of what buoyancy is. Buoyancy is the force. This water that's been raised up, just like anything that's been raised up, now has potential energy and it's delivering a force. So it's pushing back. It's trying to get into that space we just pushed it out of with an effort equal to the gravity acting on it. Sir, are you saying that in one case you're displacing a volume of water whose weight is the same as the weight of the boulder? In the other case, you're displacing a volume of water whose volume is the same as the volume of the boulder? Well, it, right, and this is what we have to be careful with. If we've got the boulder, we go in and we displace an amount of water equal to the, we displace an amount of water equal to the volume because it turns out this weighs a lot more than that water. But if we give it more volume, now we displace an amount of water equal to its weight and then we're done because once we match the weight we don't have an effort sufficient to push any more water up. I can do that manually by pushing down. I can get the water all the way up to the top and get it to overflow and then we got to clean up a mess so I'm not going to do it. If I lift this up clearly the water doesn't have to support as much because I'm supporting some. But if we just let the water and the gravity of the system come into equilibrium here's our water level. And so the question is who is the what is the controlling variable? If the density of the object exceeds that of water the controlling variable is the volume of the object. It goes in and pushes that much stuff out of the way and then the water's done working. If the density is less than water then the controlling variable is its weight. And as it goes in it pushes water out of the way until the moved water matches the weight of the object. So let's take another example where, okay, boom. All right. 
So what's in here? Oh, it's just water and we have put blue dye in it in order that you can see this water when it's in this water. And so you can see this is a water bottle that's not completely filled. And so the question A is, will it float? And I'm hoping most of you are going to say, yes, it will. But then I'm going to say, how will it float? Is it going to be right at the surface? Is it going to float with some, something sticking out? Can we get more specific? You're thinking about it, right? Here we go. In it goes, in it goes, it keeps going down, and look at where it stops. Now it turns out that it's more stable lying on its side, but it almost doesn't matter. Because if you notice, it stops at a point where the blue water lines up with the clear water. If it's vertical, it does it there, but if it tips over on its own, once again, the blue water lines up with the clear water. And so what does this mean? Well, it means that we've just verified the statement we, we made about the canoe and, and the boulder. And that is, we push water out of the way until we've pushed the weight of the object in water out of the way. And how much water is that? Well, if the object is water, we have to push an equal volume of water. So this thing is going to sink in here until the volume of the blue water has been displaced and the water has raised that level. It's a small amount next to our tape but we can clearly see how much of the bottle remains above. I know some of you uh, clear thinkers out there are saying, but what about the bottle? And I'm saying, this is one of those cheap water bottles that's a really thin layer of plastic, and its weight is of almost no consequence in this behavior. And so it gives us almost a water balloon to play with here, but it's rigid enough to have volume without water. Okay, we got that? So we're ready for the central discussion. You get the... You're often saying water seeks its level. The water seeks its level, yes. And of course, once again, if you chase that down, it's going to be a potential energy problem. It's the reason that you don't have a pile of water anywhere in the ocean. And it's the reason that absent a wave, you can't water ski or surf. Because any pile of water has to be a dynamic situation. It can't be static. You get a pile of water anywhere, and of course, it's got more potential energy than the water over here, and it will quickly come down and push that water out of the way until all the water has the same potential energy and everybody's at the same height. So water makes for a very nice device to check on levels. So now that you know everything there is to know about buoyancy, I'm going to pose you a real challenging question. We have here, and we've carefully chosen generic brands, so we've got generic cola and generic diet cola. If we take a look at them, they each tell us that there is 355 milliliters in each can. You will recognize that as 12 fluid ounces. So we are now going to put these respective cans into this water. Once again, there's a hollow in the bottom. And I'm going to put the cans in sideways to make sure we don't catch any air in those hollows. So we're going to put the regular soda in here. So in it goes. And bingo. And how many of you would have said this won't float? So the cola can is down there on the bottom. So why would cola sink? Well, of course, it's, if you read the in ingredients, the first ingredient is water. It's almost all water. So shouldn't it be like neutrally buoyant? Well, sure, but there's an aluminum can there. Okay, and so we've got a hunk of metal attached to this water, so we can come up with a pretty good hypothesis for why it doesn't float. So in goes the Diet Cola. Ooh, how about that? So let's come up with a hypothesis for why this floats. So if you shake it, there's a little air bubble in there. It isn't absolutely full, there's some airspace. And so there's airspace in here, there's aluminum there. It turns out that you could probably argue either way. Is there enough air to balance the aluminum? Well, this would seem to say that there is, but that would seem to say that there isn't. So can we come up with a consistent answer? What's different? Along with the fact that one floats and one sinks, what's different? Well, we might want to take a look at ingredients. And it turns out, and we don't even have to look at ingredients, we just have to look at the now mandated calorie content. And clearly the Diet Cola, unsurprisingly, has zero calories. The regular cola has 160 calories. And that's uh, something you gain with generic soda. It tastes so bad they have to give you extra sugar. Coke has just 140 calories. Pepsi is 150. Generic is 160. And of course it's all sugar. And so the big point is, there's more sugar here than there is here. 
If you dissolve sugar in water, you create a solution with a higher density than water. And so it turns out that the density, and let's remember that water is really the central object in density. The definitions in the metric system are related to the density of water. Water defines all of this stuff by having a mass of one gram per cubic centimeter or per milliliter. So a density of one is water. Things sink if they have a density more than one. Things float if they have a density smaller than one. These two are close. We know one of these floats and one sinks in a fluid of density one. What if we change the density of the fluid? Well, clearly if the fluid is air with almost no density, they both sink because they sit nicely on a tabletop or a countertop. But we can change the density of this by dissolving something in our tank of water because we've proposed that the density of the liquid in the can is related to how much sugar is dissolved in it. And so we have got some salt here. You say, why don't I use sugar? And the answer is because it's sticky. And so we've just got regular salt, okay? Um, we're gonna, now let's take note, and, and I, I actually had a student a while back who really uh, kind of embarrassed me. I put in the salt and stirred it up, and things changed, and the student said, well, how do you know that that change didn't come about because you stirred it? And they were totally right. That was a bad experiment. You don't wanna make two changes at once. So let's start by doing nothing but stirring and see if the cans care. And so we're stirring our little hearts out. The cans are swirling and staying right where they were a minute ago. So apparently stirring's not much of an issue. So now we're gonna add salt. And I can see some changes beginning to happen. One of the changes, and, and if you want to take a look at both of them, it turns out, because we think we're raising the density of the fluid, so our prediction would be we ought to be able to make the denser one float, but also that the less dense one should float higher. In other words, if the water is more dense, you don't have to move as much of it to match your weight. So let's stir this up. And we're getting close. That guy on the bottom is not touching the bottom much. And you note the one at the top is beginning to float high enough that it's tilting. So we add a bit more salt. Now, if you have been swimming in a salt water body, like the ocean, like the Great Salt Lake in Utah, the Dead Sea in Israel, it is much easier to float. Because if you have salt in the water, the water is denser and things don't have to move as much water out of the way. So we're pretty close now. You can see that we're no longer touching the bottom with our original can. And bingo, it's now riding up here at the surface. But it's not hard to continue to realize that the, re the regular sugar soda is denser than the diet because the diet soda is floating higher. And so it is a lower density. But it is a very interesting uh, accident that the densities of 12 ounce cans of soda are so close to matching the density of water that we can do something like this with minor changes and see major differences. Hi again. Uh, now that you're an expert on buoyancy, we're gonna take a look at what you thought was a simple problem. Look at that. Right, we have a bubble gun. So what's a bubble? Well, it's air, right? It's this little bubble of air. But you're noticing it's sinking. These bubbles are dropping rapidly. Now why is that? Is there a good reason? Like it's, it's air. Why doesn't it just hang with the rest of the air? And of course you're probably thinking, well yeah, but it's got a container like that soda did. Now it's not an aluminum container, but it's water and soap, which is clearly more dense than air. And so the combination of a sphere of air and a thin shell of water is more dense than the sphere of air that's the size of those two guys together. And so consequently, our bubbles succumb to gravity relatively fast. Now what we have here is an aquarium. And 
it's full of a fluid like any aquarium. It's just that this is a less interesting fluid. It's full of air. And bingo, we can watch bubbles do their bubble thing. And it doesn't matter whether they're in or out. Gravity is still in charge. But what if we fill it with something else? What if we take you back to grade school and that great volcano experiment you did where you put vinegar and baking soda together. And this is a complex thing. We got vinegar here, we got baking soda here, and you know we're doing chemistry, so it's really important to measure carefully. And this is foaming its little heart out. Now, do you remember that volcano experiment? Can you tell me what's bubbling? Like, where'd these bubbles come from? What's happening? We clearly need a little more vinegar, a little more baking soda, and it's frothing away. It turns out it's CO2. And for you folks who actually stayed awake in chemistry class, air is N2 and O2. Uh, it's, both of those are quite similar in terms of molecular weight. CO2 is O2, obviously, with a C hooked up. And so it turns out that CO2 is denser than air. And so we've generated CO2, but because it's denser than air, it's really not flying out into the room, it's sitting here. And so if we take our bubble gun and we shoot some bubbles, it looks like we have stopped gravity in the container. I mean, these guys are like hanging there. Let's get him out of the way so you can see that there is a bubble that does not care about gravity. Well, it actually does, but it cares about a combination of forces. And so it's got the same buoyant force that our bottle did in the water. The level of CO2 is right around here. Now you say, well, why aren't they floating at the same height? Well, they're two different sizes, so there's two different amounts of soap. But there's another interesting thing that happens. It turns out that the soap film is a semi-permeable membrane, and the oxygen and CO2 can actually migrate. So with time, these guys begin to sink because we get a little CO2 drifting in and a little O2 drifting out. But now that we fully understand why things float, this isn't magic anymore. And we can find the level of the CO2 in the container. Uh, this is a fun experiment to do. You can do it, you know, it's grocery store stuff. It's a bubble gun, it's vinegar and baking soda. Important point, the container needs to be uh, almost a foot in any dimension because if it's smaller, static electricity generally messes you up and the bubbles find an edge and don't hang in the middle. And glass seems to be less uh, prone to static electricity than plastic. But you know, this is worth doing, huh? I mean, mess up your house uh, and you can actually do some neat science. We have here a one kilogram block of aluminum. It's actually a cylindrical block. And right now it's just hanging in the air. So all of its weight, if it's one kilogram, its weight is 9.8 newtons. So all of its weight is being held from the top now. So you can really see the full 9.8 newtons on this scale. Now this scale reads newtons. Unfortunately, this scale down below reads kilograms. So just bear that in mind. <coughs> and we have zeroed the, made the, the tear adjustment on the scale. So we've zeroed it out so that the weight of the water itself does not show up. I guess we can use the principle of Archimedes, and if we wanted to, we could infer the volume of this block of aluminum by seeing how big a buoyant force is exerted by the water when the aluminum is fully immersed. So let's give that a try. So we will gradually lift up the water to meet the aluminum, and we'll see that as, the, as more and more of the aluminum is immersed in the water, we'll see the, uh, the weight carried by the water, or the force exerted by the water, basically, on the aluminum will go up, and then the force exerted by the upper support will go down. And remember, these uh, scales are a factor of 10 apart. So it's gone down from 9.8 newtons on top to about six newtons. Okay, actually, see, now it's not changing anymore. So now the aluminum is completely immersed. That's actually kind of neat to step back and see. So you can see that when we're partially, so we're not immersed at all, and we read are 9.8 newtons here, basically. The, the precision of the mechanical scale is a little bit, it's not ideal. We're going to repeat this with a digital scale in a moment. But you get a nice visual impact here. So as we immerse more and more of the aluminum in the water, you see that the fraction of the aluminum block's weight carried by the upper scale is reduced, and it's made up by the weight carried by the water, the buoyant force of the water. And the buoyant force of the water is then transmitted down to the, to the ground through the scale. So if we get to the point where we are completely submersed, then of course it doesn't matter 
whether we continue to you know, immerse it more and more. Of course, if you eventually reach the bottom and keep going, then everything will be held by the bottom of the jar. But we want the, the buoyant force. So it seems as if when the aluminum is fully immersed in the water, it looks as if instead of about 10 newtons, we have about 6.4 newtons red on the top. So that means we should have something like three and a half newtons down below. And indeed, this looks like one, two, three, about three and a half little ticks. We know that the buoyant force equals the mass of the displaced water. And we know that the mass of the displaced Displaced water must be about 0.35 kilograms, since it's whatever water has a weight of about three and a half newtons. And I guess that would let us infer the volume of this block. We know its mass, we know its volume, so we can infer its density. And it should check out to be roughly 2.8 times the density of water that we expect for aluminum. So I guess we could give that a try. So we have the mass is 1.0 kilogram, and then the weight is 9.8 newtons. And then we have the buoyant force seems to be about three and a half newtons. And that should equal the density of water times G times the volume of this block. So that lets us say that the volume of the block is three and a half newtons divided by the density of water, which is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and then times little g, which is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So this is gonna be an absurdly small number of, of cubic meters, but basically it's gonna turn out to be 0.35 liters. If you put it in liters, it's basically uh, 0.35 liters. Let's check that the density seems to come out about right. Okay, then the density of the block would be its mass of the block divided by the volume of the block, which is, so there's one kilogram, 1.0 kilogram, and I think we're we're gonna find a big cancellation here and we'll have 1,000 kilogram per cubic meter. Okay, 1,000 kilogram per cubic meter. And then we'll have 9.8 newtons per kilogram. And then downstairs we'll have three and a half newtons. Right, so we get a whole bunch of tens divided by 3.5. So it's gonna turn out to be a density of roughly three times the density of water. 0.35 times 10 to the minus three cubic meters, which is 0.35 liters, so that makes sense. And then, so remember in SI units, densities are like water's density is a thousand in SI units. So you get uh, 2800 kilograms per cubic meter. So that's 2.8 times the density of water, which I think is the right answer for aluminum. Okay, 2.7 times the density of water is the, the accepted value. We got 2.8. We're gonna repeat this with a digital scale and maybe we'll see if we get a little closer. You see the idea anyway. So the buoyant force is the weight of the displaced water. Let's go back to our one kilogram block of aluminum and we can weigh it with our digital scale. And we get 9.80 Newtons. Then let's immerse it in water. And you can see the weight held by the top support goes down as we immerse it more and more. And then once it is fully immersed, then this reading doesn't change anymore. Okay, so now we have 6.45 Newtons. So we can subtract and we get 3.35 Newtons. So then to speed things up, so we know the specific gravity is just the weight of the object divided by the buoyant force. So that will give us the specific gravity. It's just the ratio of these two, 9.80 Newtons divided by 3.35 Newtons. So this should work out to be the density of aluminum, 2.92. So now we're gonna try a different trick. We're gonna say, instead of weighing it in water, let's weigh it in glycerin. Or maybe we're weighing it in a mystery fluid and it'll turn out the mystery fluid is glycerin. So here's our aluminum cylindrical block. It's one kilogram, 9.8 Newtons. And now instead of immersing it in water, we're gonna immerse it in, well, we think this is glycerin. And we think glycerin probably has a density about one and a quarter times the density of water, but let's just check that out. So the buoyant force should be about 25% larger in glycerin than it is in water because the density of glycerin is higher. So the weight of the displaced glycerin is bigger than the weight of the displaced water. So let's try it. So we will immerse it in the mystery fluid, which is glycerin. And okay, it's just about to make contact. So you still have 9.7, 9.8 newtons. I don't know how 9.8 became 9.7. And okay, you can see it's going down, it's going down, it's going down. And now we are completely immersed. So we're down to five, looks like 
well, okay, it seems like 5.5 roughly. See, if we keep immersing it more, it doesn't change the answer anymore. So we're fully immersed. So it seems like we have, well, it looks like 5.50 newtons roughly. Uh, we had 9.80 newtons minus 5.50 newton. This difference. And so this is going to be our buoyant force. This is the F buoyant in glycerin. So there's 4.3 newtons. Instead of 3.35 newtons, now we have 4.30 newtons, roughly. It's a bigger buoyant force. 4.30 newtons. And, you know, we don't have to do a whole lot of work here. We could say, okay, we know that F buoyant must be the density of glycerin times little g times the volume of the block. But we don't have to do all that work because we know the density of water is, well, the specific gravity of water is one. It's density, that's how units is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So say, okay, water is one. This buoyant force is 4.3 newtons compared to the buoyant force of 3.35 newtons in water. If we just take the ratio of these two numbers, that should be the density, that should be the specific gravity of glycerin, the density of glycerin divided by the density of water. So let's try that, 4.3 divided by 3.35, and we get 1.28. So, okay, so you say F buoyant in glycerin divided by F buoyant in water. So remember, this is the density of glycerin times little g times the volume. This is the density of water times little g times the volume. Little g is the same, v is the same. So this is just the ratio of the two densities. And so this is 4.30 newtons divided by 3.35 newtons is 1.28. Okay, so we decided the specific gravity of our mystery liquid is 1.28. It should be 1.28 times the density of water. And the accepted value for the density of glycerin, the specific gravity of glycerin, is 1.26. So that seems good to two or three significant figures. I guess that kind of makes sense because we probably believe that we measure things to about two significant figures. Good. Let's play Archimedes with the digital scale. So we have here, in the real lab version of this, you have to infer what the material is. But let's just say I have a pretty good hunch that this is going to turn out to be steel. I have a pretty good hunch this is going to turn out to be aluminum. This readout is reading the weight supported by this little hook. So if I take this large steel, well, large unknown material nut and I suspend it, then we can say what is its weight when it's just in air. So it's just being suspended entirely by the hook. And its weight in air is one point, okay, Okay, let's say 1.61 newtons. Now, we have water down below, and we can infer its volume by measuring the buoyant force of the water on the nut when it's fully immersed. So let's do that. Well, we're going to lift the water up to immerse the nut, and we should see that the weight held by the upper support gets smaller and smaller and smaller as I immerse the larger and larger fraction of the nut. But then once the nut is fully immersed, then continuing to immerse it to a larger depth won't change the buoyant force. So, so the buoyant force plus the force held by the upper support together add up to the, the weight in air of the nut. So you can see that as I continue to, if I change the depth at which it's immersed, as long as it's fully immersed, then this buoyant force doesn't change. Of course, it would change if it hit the bottom, but we're not gonna do that because then it's not a buoyant force anymore. Okay, so we have 1.41 newtons. So we don't get a whole lot of digits out of this, but 1.41 newtons. So this is the weight in air. And then we have 1.41 newtons it is the apparent weight when immersed in water. So that lets us infer, so we just subtract these two. So if you subtract, you get 0.20 newtons. The buoyant force is 0.20 newtons, and that equals the weight of the displaced water. So that is the density of water times little g times the volume of the nut. Then we can infer the volume of the nut. So then the volume of the nut equals F buoyant divided by the density of water and also divided by g. The density of water in SI units is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So a cubic meter of water weighs a metric ton. 2.04 times 10 to the minus 5 cubic meters. Now, we could have just looked at this and said the buoyant force is 0.2 newtons. That is the weight weight of 0.02 kilograms, so that's the weight of 20 grams, so then you'd say, well, that must be 20 cubic centimeters. We could have just kind of in our heads said, oh yeah, that's 20 cubic centimeters, which is, see, this is 20.4 times 10 to the minus 6 cubic meters, which is 20.4 cubic centimeters. Uh, meanwhile, the mass of the nut is going to be, this is 1.61, so the mass of the nut is going to be about 0.16 kilograms, so let's uh, divide by 9.8, so the mass of the nut is, so that's 0.164 kilograms. So then the density of the nut, which we think is going to turn out to be the density of steel. So we think it should be something like 7.9 times the density of water. So it should be about 7,900 in SI units. So let's see how that works out. The density of the nut is, so that's the mass of the nut, divided by the volume of the nut. And let's see what we get. 8050 kilograms per cubic 
meter. So that's like about eight times the density of water. The accepted values for steel are between about 7.8 and eight times the density of water, 7,800 to 8,000. That makes sense, that's, I think that's compatible within our measurement errors. Remember, after we do this subtraction, we probably only have a little, we have, don't even quite have two digits. We probably have like just under two digits of information. So this could be 8.0 or 8.1. So that seems pretty decent. Now, let's try the same thing with an aluminum object. Okay, then, so we're back to reading pretty close to zero. Then we take our aluminum object, and our aluminum object has a weight of 0.33 newtons. Could be 0.34. So let's say 0.335. It seems to be bouncing around between 0.33 and 0.34. So, and I don't know what you want to call this thing. This is uh, looks like a little piece of an aluminum flange. We're gonna call it the thing. So the mass of the thing times g is 0.335 newtons. Maybe we'll say 0.338. The apparent weight when immersed, when immersed in water. is 0.201 newtons. So then we can subtract and we get 0.137 newtons is the buoyant force. So that is the density of water times little g times the volume of the thing. Then meanwhile, so now we know the mass of the thing is approximately 0.03 kilograms. We can work that out getting the decimal place in a minute. And then we're gonna get the volume of the thing. So the volume of the thing is going to be this F buoyant divided by the density of water, also divided by G, so that's 0.137 newtons divided by, and here's a thousand kilograms per cubic meter, and here's 9.8 newtons per kilogram. And then meanwhile, the mass of the thing is going to be this number divided by 9.8, 0.035 kilograms. And the volume of the thing is going to be some absurdly small number of cubic meters, 14.0 times 10 to the minus 6 cubic meters, which is actually 14 cubic centimeters. And then we'll say, what's the density of the thing? So we, so we hope it turns out to be a density of aluminum. Density of aluminum is about 2,700 in SI units. So the density of the thing is, so that's the mass divided by the volume, and we get 2467. Too bad it's not 2468. 2467 kilograms per Per cubic meter. It's like two and a half, 2.5 times the density of water. I was expecting 2.7 times the density of water, but again, we don't seem to have too many decimal places, so we have some experimental uncertainty. So, okay, you can see, by the way, why when you only have two digits worth of information, you don't go typically writing down like four or five digits because certainly the seven is meaningless, the six is probably meaningless. It's probably, we think in reality, if we had uh, better precision, it'd be more like two seven something instead of two four something. Anyway, not too bad though. So, before we go on, let's just point out a way to dramatically simplify the math and that's because we often talk about this thing called specific gravity. And specific gravity is a substance's density divided by the density of water. And in units where you use cubic centimeters and grams, of course, the density of water is one. In SI units, the density is this kind of annoying 1,000 instead of one. So if we simply take the weight of the object divided by the buoyant force, remember the buoyant force is the weight of the displaced water. So we have the weight of the nut divided by the weight of the displaced water that gives us the specific gravity of the material the nut is made of. 1.61 newtons of weight of the nut divided by 0.20 newtons of the weight of the displaced water. You just divide those two things, you get 8.05. So there's the specific gravity of steel. And then we take the other example. We have the weight of the thing, which we think is aluminum. Weight of the thing is 0.338 newtons. And then we divide that by the buoyant force. The buoyant force is the weight of the equivalent quantity of water, and that's 0.137 newtons. So you take 0.338 newtons divided by 0.137 newtons. That's a dimensionless number. That's our specific gravity. And that's going to be 2.47. So again, that's basically the specific gravity of aluminum within our measurement uncertainty. The weight of the object divided by the buoyant force when it's fully immersed. So again, in this case, we got 2.47 for this ratio. So that's the, that's the specific gravity of aluminum, more or less. And in the first case, we got 8.05 for the ratio of this weight to the buoyant force, which again, that's pretty close to the accepted value for the specific gravity of steel, which is, you know, 7.9 to 8 roughly.